Good evening, friends. How are y'all doing tonight? I pray that you've had a good week so far. Um, yeah, today was a gorgeous day. Um, the sky this morning was just bursting with color from the oranges to the pinks to the purples to the blue. It was an amazing morning. And this evening, it was such a subtle color of yellows and oranges. It was beautiful. I have to say, I am, of course, fascinated by watching the skies and the motion and the movement and hearing and seeing God throughout that time. It's a glorious time to be able to maybe reflect a little bit, stop, pause, Say, so here I am, God, in a time that is so uncertain for you and me, for a time that we maybe even want to reach out and just say, God, take us away. Help us to understand. Help us to be your servants. Sometimes that's all we can say in a time that is frustrating and maybe even irritating. In conversations I've had in the last few days, there is anxiety, there's frustration, there's dread, there is concern. And I want us to pull back and also say, God, there is joy. There is joy on this night. There is joy even even as we struggle to make sense maybe of what's going on in our country and in our world, we struggle to wonder. And yet what I know is that every morning at whatever time it is, I start to see the peaks of color coming through, that God is present. And even as I'm enjoying the last of my Christmas still hanging, if we were in Sweden, actually, today would have been the day, the final day to have taken things down. I just haven't done it yet. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe not. We'll see. But maybe these are the little things of joy. You know, whether it be the sunrises or the sunsets, it's, it, it's the conversations we sit and have with people that we go, yeah, God is still present, even though right now our hearts are heavy and we're not sure what's going on. We struggle and we go, okay, I want to make plans, God. I want to I wanna start planning the summer. I want vacation planned. <laughs> I know I've already been thinking about it. Where do I want to go this year? I don't know. I don't know because... I don't know. Uh, last summer, um, outside of the quick trip to Florida to take Austin furniture, <laughs> there was no other vacation. I do want one this year. I know it's healthy. I know it's good. I just haven't done it. I'm hoping and praying that this year will be that year that we get that rejuvenation, that we all get to go to some new places. Maybe see some new things, or maybe it is just seeing our friends that we haven't been able to, to see for some time because of COVID and everything else. But God, we know that you're present. So, okay. Uh, we're pretty close to 7 o'clock. We're going to get started, so make sure and grab your Bibles. I um, I'll, I have to be honest with you tonight. I kind of panicked at one point in the week. Uh, it has been an, <laughs> it's been a crazy week. It's been kind of an insane week. Um, even since last Wednesday, I feel like all I've done is go, and which is good because God has had me having some phenomenal conversations with people. Um, I have, um, it, it, 
there's going to be some cool things happening in our church, and I am so excited about it because God is opening doors. He's opening the way for people to come to faith. He is bringing people in. The, one, the other thing I know is that, um, and what I'm discovering is that our churches, and especially after I was at a pastor meeting, that we all are experiencing, all of our churches, a growth, a renewal, a revival. Um, we are gaining members um, all over the country. And what we're starting to find is that the church that is hosting the Facebook or the online service is, is the mother church, in a sense. And we have things happening across the country. Um, one of the churches in Nebraska has a little pot of people like in Washington State and a pot of people in Michigan and a pot of people. And they're all supporting um, basically, they've got all these little house churches that are growing up out of their church and supporting the mother church, in a sense, um, of what's going on. It is really fascinating in this culture that we're in right now and in a time where things are changing, um, where we're hearing some things um, that we don't like, that we're starting to see our churches, our online churches, really just kind of get bigger. And I'm excited about that, what that potential, I've said that all along. And it, that potential is there for us to, um, as faithful people, and then gather in small groups in that community that we are all in and still have church and, and be the church. The church isn't the building. The church is, um, you know, the church has one business, okay? And I, and I was fascinated that, all of us that sat in, the, sat in a room, all eight of us, seven of us, anyway, agreed. The church has one business, and only one business, and that's to talk about faith. It's the only business we belong in. It's the only thing we do well, and it's what we're trained to do, is to be a people of faith telling the story. And that's what we're doing tonight. We're telling the story. And as we dig deeper, you know, I hope that as we dig deeper into going through Genesis, you see the parallels or you see how Genesis ties to Matthew, Mark, Luke. I mean, I noticed it on Sunday even, the, the text tied back over to Genesis 1. The, the, the correlations and how the fulfilling of the text is so cool how that happens. I hope you notice that too. Let's begin. Let's begin in prayer. God, we are so, so excited to be with you tonight. We are so blessed to be with you. We only have one story to tell, and that is the story of you whether we define you as Old Testament or New Testament, it is the story of you, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, all in one, you come to us. You come to us this night. So lift our hearts and lift our minds and let us breathe deep into that wellspring of faith. To hear your story. In your name we pray. Amen. <coughs> okay. Let's start. We're in, of course, Genesis. We're starting on chapter 25. We're almost halfway through Genesis. I don't think we're, we're not going to make it through there tonight. But... Oh my, we are going to pray for one of our uh, fellow friends. In fact, we're going to pray right now um, for Anthony. Um, oh my, his blood sugars were high. He's having surgery for a kidney stone. So God, oh, bless this servant. Bless Anthony. 
be with him tonight and be with the surgeons, be with him in his recovery. God, let him be healed and whole. God, we know you are present and you are touching him tonight. Oh God, just lift Anthony and let him know your presence. I ask this in your name. Amen. Oh, my prayers are with you, Anthony. Uh, keep me posted. Okay. 25, verse 1. This is an interesting segue for us. And we're kind of, we are making a segue in Genesis right now, a little bit. But right now, what we're finding is this is going to be about Abraham's um, descendants and his death. Okay, is happening in this section. In, the, in these verses in 1 to 18. So it's kind of like 25 is split into two sections. and But it's bracketed, and it's interesting that the, how Abraham's breath, death is bracketed. In verse 1, we hear about Keturah. Keturah is going to now be the third wife, um, although... She definitely is a concubine. She was not one of the favored, obviously. So verse 1, we get Keturah in, in the midst. But in verse 12, we are bracketed, Abraham's death is bracketed by Hagar, of course, who is Ishmael's line. God's promise, though, um, is on the way to fulfillment through Yitzhak, through Isaac, and yet he is yet childless, and only a small portion of the land um, has been permanently acquired. And so it's interesting, though, because Sari, or Sarah has already died. We have, we, but we're bracketing Abraham's death with a concubine and a concubine with wife three and two. So it's kind of interesting. So look at that as we go through this. We're going to get the genealogy, and I, I, I only want to go through 18, these first 18 verses for a reason, and you'll see why as we start to go through this. Okay. Okay. Well, no, Sarah hasn't died. I'm sorry. I'm wrong. Yeah, because... In, 60, in verse 67, Yitzhak brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, to meet Rivka, to meet Rebecca. So I, I apologize. I made an error there in my, in my speaking. So let's start with verse, ow, verse 1. I just rolled my chair into my desk. Okay, verse 1. Now Abraham had taken another wife, and her name was Keturah. Now Keturah means incense, like incense the smelling stuff. Um, she is going to have six sons. Um, now you have to remember, Keturah and obviously Hagar, we know have lesser standing in um, everything in this, in this whole picture. And I want us to remember, remember that. Um, I got to make myself a note. Okay. Um, so, six sons are going to be born to Keturah. She bore Zimran and Yokshan, Medan and Midian, Yishbak and Shua. <laughs> Their names crack me up. I think it should just be Bill and Joe and Jeff and John and we'd be fine. But, it's interesting to look at what their names mean as well. And it all it, it's interesting. We don't know the meaning of all their names, but we do a few. So Zimron, it, her, his name means antelope. Antelope. Midian means strife. Um... And I can't read what I wrote. <laughs> that sometimes becomes a problem for me because I write so much in my Bibles. I kind of forget what I wrote. Anyway, let's go back to verse 1 because there is an issue here. 
Um, now, Abraham had taken, okay, had taken, think about that word um, a little bit, and had taken another wife, but it's really not, it was not the same wordage used in the relationship with Sarah. And with Sarah, there was a different understanding. He didn't take in her. He loved her. And so, again, we have to look at this and understand through the lens and the eyes of, of, of Genesis being written, not of our time. We would not think about having concubines and multiple wives, but you have to understand prodigy was extremely important. Um, babies die. I mean, people died. They did not live to uh, the ages. Um, many children died very young. And so I think we have to consider that this is not about, you know, anything. But this was not a, probably a love affair um, at all for Abraham. He had taken her. Okay. I wish I could read what I wrote, but I can't. So we'll go on. Verse three. Okay, so we've already got the first six. Okay. Now, Yokshan begot Shiva and Dedan. Now, they're Arab, though. Um, this is kind of a, it is interesting about where we're getting some of the, and, and this is part of the historical lineage, too, um, that we're getting as well. So I think we need to remember that. Now, Dedan's sons were Asherites and the Letishites and the Lemonites. That, those are different nations that were being formed out of the heritage. And the Letishites were oppressed people. They were oppressed, um, were not in good standing. Um, these are part of the Arab tribes that um, are east of Canaan uh, and, and lived on the east side of Canaan, okay? Um, Midian's sons were Epha, Ephor, Hanukkah, Avida, and Elda. All these were Keturah's sons. They were children of the flesh, but not of the promise. And that's what it's important for us to remember, is that these are children of the flesh. And remember that we talked about that flesh and promise back in the beginning. And there's a reason for remembering that. Now, here's what's interesting. Epha, E-F-A, that first name, means gloom, gloom and doom kind of thing. Gloom. Ephor means gazelle, the animal. Now, my guess is, personality-wise, Epha may have had a very depressive kind of gloomy personality. Maybe Ephor was a gazelle and ran and jumped a lot. I, I think it's fun to imagine what those names would have meant as well. Hanuk is initiated. He initiated things, maybe. He began things. Avida means the father of knowledge. A father of knowledge. Okay. And Elda was a god of knowledge. So we have the father of knowledge and God of knowledge. Now, not big G, but a little G God, okay? Okay, verse five. Now that we got through some more names, you know, I, I, thought, I just find it interesting what sometimes the names mean. Verse five. But Abraham gave over all that was his to Yitzhak, to Isaac. He is the primary heir. If there was a will to be written, and they had written them in those days, and in some ways they did, by telling the story, by the lineage, by the patronage, the lineage and the, the will was, and the testament was written, and it was final. There was nothing you were going to do to change those, to change those things, okay? So, every gave over all that was his to Yitzhak. Everything was that was going to be Yitzhak's. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. 
Verse 6. And to the sons of the concubines that Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts, and he sent them away from Yitzhak, his son, while he was still alive eastward to the east land. This is where the separation is really going to happen. He's now, Abraham is being fair to his other sons or the other children. He's giving them the gifts. He's giving them the land. He's giving them their portion of things, but he wants them to leave. You know, it's kind of a, it's now time, children, to leave home and go. I need you out of the house now. So go. Take your camels, take your silver, take your gold, and go to the land that I've already sent you to. I'm sending you east. East, for me, would be that way, behind me. East, to the east land, behind Can to Cana. Um, and it was really to protect Itzak. Isaac at that point needed to be protected. Otherwise, they would have, there could have been, um, some of the siblings might have attempted to do harm to him, to try to inherit then what he already had. And that was not going to be possible. God obviously was going to protect, was going to protect um, Yitzhak because he was the promised one, not the one of the flesh. Okay? Um, See, the flesh and the spirit can't live together. Or, or, um, yeah, the flesh and the spirit can't live together in the spirit. And so there has to be been that cleansing. I, I, I want us to think about that maybe in relationship to today. To where are we today? What are we doing? How do we live? Do we live in the flesh? Do we live in the spirit? Um, they, don't, they don't mix. It is a matter of making a decision about how do we live? What do we want? Um, are, is our life valued from God's perspective or man's perspective? Where are our, where, how do we make decisions from God or from man? How do we, you know, and that's why I, la I kind of chuckle at people when they ask me, um, you know, what do I do? And I tell them I'm a pastor and then they, they'll ask me, well, what else do you do? I'm like, well, I, I, I belong to Kiwanis and I belonged and I work with scouts and I, I serve on the board at the food pantry, and I and I do um, work with all with all the other pastors around me, and they're like, "Well, but what do you do? How do you separate everything?" And I'm like, "I don't. I can't separate my world. My world is one. What I'm called to do is be a child of God in this world, in this time, in this place. How do I make decisions about whatever it is? Well, let me tell you something." You know, this thing that you guys that we're using is really worn and tattered for a reason. I go there, find out what does God think about it. I pray. I talk to God a lot about what's going on. I want you to stop and pause at those moments when God is nudging you, or maybe when the devil's nudging you and trying to get things to go his way. Stop and think about where is God? Where do we make our decisions from? From a place of the spirit or the, pace, the place of the flesh? It, it so defines who we are as God's children. Okay. Verse seven. That was your mini, that was another mini sermon in the middle there. Okay. Y'all get, y'all get, y'all know me well enough now. Okay. Verse seven. Now, these are the days and years of the life of Abraham, which he lived. A hundred, hundred years and 75 years and five years. Then he breathed his last. Abraham died at a good ripe age, old and abundant in days, and was gathered to his kinspeople. So, yet, so Abraham was 175 years old when he died. That's a lot of years. I don't know about you. That's a lot of years. Yitzhak would have been at this point 75 years old because he would have been, um, um, Abraham would have been 60 when the boys were born. 
Jacob and Esau would have been 15 years old at this point. Ish Ishmael would have been 80. And Abraham sojourned for that 100 years. Okay. Then he breathed his last, I think is an interesting um, statement, the way it's written in this text, because it is about his faith and his strength. And it, it is the elegant words of death, I think, that he breathed his last. And if we stop and think about it, um, how is the crucifixion text written as well? That Jesus breathed his last. He breathed his last. Abraham does the same thing because the Spirit of God has been dwelling in him as the, the one to carry the, the, the uh, lineage. He breathed his last. And he was gathered with his kin people. This is about the death and burial is really what this is. Everyone gathered um, for that time, at that time, just like we do today, um, at least in most, time, most times during our day. <laughs> okay, verse 9. Now, this is going to be, in verse 9, the last time um, that we will hear about Ishmael being um, with his, um, together with his, um, with his brother. So Yitzhak and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, son of Tezor the Hittite, that faces Mamre, the field that Abraham had acquired from the sons of Het. There were buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. Okay, I, I was right earlier. I don't know why. Okay, I'm conf I'm. Okay, I'm confused. I think. But anyway, um, see, the boys had been estranged up until now. Came back together as Abraham was dying to be there. This will be the last time we actually hear of Ishmael. His name may show up, but we're not going to hear from him again. Um, okay. See, Sarah would have been buried in that same grave 38 years um, earlier. That's why I'm trying to figure out when in verse 67 we hear that Yitzhak brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother. He took Rifka and she became his wife. I'm... Oh, now I get it. They went to Mother's tent, but not that Mother was there. But that, that was the transition from Sarah to Rifka, Rebecca being now the wife in Sarah's tent. They came to for that comfort that needed to be there. Okay, I have these moments. What can I say? I all of a sudden get it. Okay, <laughs> you know it's pretty funny. I do that in the middle of a sermon sometimes, and I go, "Oh, now I got it." After all this time, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chapter twenty-three is where Sarah died. Uh, yeah, a little ways back. Yeah. So I, I got confused. Okay, verse 11. <laughs> now it was after Abraham's death that God blessed Yitzhak, his son. Um, and Yitzhak settled by the well of the living one who sees me. Okay, now remember, this is the um, near the wilderness of Beersheba and uh, Paran. And the name of that well is the Lahoi Roy. Um, we've seen that one, that well show up before as well. So um, he's being blessed because of Abraham and now in his own life. The, he is the second of the patriarchs. So let's remember the three. Who are the three patriarchs? Abraham, Yitzhak, and Jacob. 
So Abraham now has passed. So the first patriarch has passed. Now we have Yitzhak, Isaac coming into play. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, which we hear often as the three patriarchs. So now we have um, Yitzhak coming into his own. He is now having to own his title and who he is as a God, as a child of God and now leading the lineage uh, forward. Look at verse 12. Now, these are the beginnings of Ishmael, son of Abraham. Okay, here we're going to just get the lineage. We're not hearing about the boys being together. Okay, that's what I said. We'll hear his name, but not that they will be together again. Okay. Um, whom Hagar, the Egyptian woman, Sarah's maid, bore to Abraham. So genealogy is his, pos is his posterity. And it is for all of the biblical people, especially. But in some ways, isn't genealogy important for you and me? Don't we, and I do, I, I, I go backwards and it's like, well, I am the daughter of Vernon, who is the son of Raymond and Marie, who is, and, and we can go back, and in lineage, and on my mom's side, I would say I'm the daughter of Laura, I am the granddaughter of Ruby and Marie, or of um, Joe and Marie, uh, Joe and Ruby, I'll get their names straight, and then we go back into the Olsons, and we go backwards, and we end up in Sweden. My dad's side will end up in Britain. So, okay, so the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names after the order of their beginnings. Okay, the sons of Ishmael, they're actually become 12 princes out of that. You see how the numbers keep playing roles in everything we do. Okay, so Ishmael's firstborn was uh, Nebayat and Kedar, Ab. Ab Ad, Adbeel, Mifzam, Mishma, Duma, and Masa. Okay, we do know, we do know on some of them where they end up or if they show up again in Scripture. Like Nevi'at, the firstborn, shows up again in Isaiah 60, verse 7. Um, cause it, it is a town, um, and a region from the Euphrates to the Red Sea. So there are some times that some of these do, do show back up. It's not like Ishmael's family is just not ever mentioned cause they are. Um, Kedar is mentioned again in Isaiah 21, 13, um, as an Arabian, um, the Arabic language actually lived, um, came out of that area, and they lived in tents and pastures and were part of the Sinites, okay? So we have different regions that we start picking up their names in. Abdil and Mifsan and are not mentioned again. Mish, Mishva, Duma might have been mentioned in Genesis 21, but Mass is not mentioned again. The Duma name may have been hearing silence and patience. And that's the only reference we have back to those names. Uh, then for the, as we go on through the names in verse 15, Hadad and Tima, Yitur, Nafish, and Kidma. Um, Hadad and Tima are possible cities in the, in the um, city of Adra in the Arabian um, Petra region, um, possibly uh, Tima would have been in the, a part of the Arabian desert. Uh, Yitur uh, is came out of um, the Iturians are part of that. They're in Arabia as well. Yit, yit, yeah, Nafish and Kidma. There is no mention again. Of them anywhere. I'm struggling through the names. Again, I want them to be George and Henry and John and, and Ray and Bud and all that. Okay, verse 16. These are the sons of Ishmael, 
these their names in their villages and in their corrals, twelve princes for their twelve tribes. That's kind of interesting to go backwards and look at some of the meanings of some of those, and we can do that. And the word Egypt actually means world, world. Kadar, to be dark. Now you have to wonder if there's, if there isn't something to that, okay? Abdil, as a servant of God. We don't know what some of these became, but we know what their names mean. Mifzam, a sweet odor. Mishma, hearing. Duma, silence. Masa, burden. Hadad, chamber. And the rest of them leave history, and the words actually leave history. We don't know what some of those words, some of the names mean, um, where we can translate part of them over. We can't do them all, because they just aren't there anymore. Verse 17. And these are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years and 30 years and 7 years. Then he breathed his last. So he was 137 years old when he died. And he died and was gathered to his kinspeople. Now they dwelt from Havilah to Shur, which faces Egypt, back to where you come towards Assyria, in the presence of all his brothers did his inheritance fall. That gives us our lineage up through now. Um, starting with the next part, we kind of go into a, the story of Jacob, Yaakov in Hebrew. Yaakov is Jacob. Um, so we'll, we'll keep journeying through this. Um, I, I am just phenomenally excited about what, what the story continues to enlighten us to about God's journey and his people and how, how difficult it was for them as it is for us in our days. Oh, my friends, time has gotten away from us now. Um, please join me again. Please join me on Sunday if you'd like at 10 o'clock right here. Or if you're in the region and in the area, come and visit us. Um, we'd love to have, have starting to have people gathering back, wearing our masks and distancing and all of that, of course. But we know that God is with us. God is carrying us on our journey. He does go with us. He walks before us to empty our paths. He walks next to us to guide us and hold our hand. He walks behind us to protect our backs. He walks above us, I think, to give us courage. And he walks below us to hold us when we stumble. My friends, my prayers, I ask for you to lift up um, tonight some people as, and through your week, Bud and Betty. Um, Bud is um, very ill with COVID. Um, Larry, Anthony, our country time of indecision and a time of turmoil and unrest. God needs to and is present. Let us lift up our arms and our hands to him and say, come, Holy Spirit, come. Let us know your presence. And now, my friends, peace be with you. Shalom this night. Go, love, and serve. Amen. See you next week.